From awaytogarden.com and robinhoodradio.com, this is A Way to Garden with Margaret Roach, your weekly invitation to dig in and grow. I've spoken recently on the show about my personal war on certain ground covers I planted years ago that have turned out to be hideous thugs. Many other gardeners I hear from have likewise come to lament their overly cooperative spreading plant choices like rambunctious vinca or pachysandra. We all want ground covers to do weed suppressing duty and tie the garden together aesthetically, but the wrong choices can definitely backfire. Native ground covers are a smarter alternative that will provide those and other benefits, and they're today's topic, but first, these messages. Programming and underwriting support from Brushwood Nursery. For more than 20 years, Brushwood Nursery has shipped the finest selection of clematis and other vines all over the United States with full gallon sized plant and free shipping. Their website is full of beautiful pictures and information on growing clematis. BrushwoodNursery.com. Programming and underwriting support from Garden Tool Company. Garden Tool Company's wide selection of heirloom quality, quality tools for your gardening passion is backed by outstanding customer service, fast shipping, and ongoing support. GardenToolCompany.com. My guest to talk native ground covers is Duncan Himmelman of Mount Cuba Center, the noted native plant garden and research center in Delaware, where he's the education manager. A course on native ground covers taught by Duncan is one of a half dozen on-demand recorded courses that Mount Cuba is currently offering to the public. Welcome back, Duncan. Thanks for joining me again. Oh, certainly, Margaret. It's great to be here again. So before we get started, we'll say we'll have another giveaway like we did, I don't know, a month or so ago when you visited to talk weeds, one of the other courses that you've been doing at Mount Cuba that's available virtually. And we'll have a, I'll buy a ticket or two for people to Uh, attend the classes as the giveaway. So we'll have that with a transcript of the show over on awaytogarden.com. But as I mentioned in the introduction, I'm now eradicating some naughty plants here. (laughs) (laughs) Sound familiar? (laughs) Oh, yeah, very much familiar. Um, And I I agree with you in terms of plants like Vinca and uh, Japanese Pachysandra. Um, you know, back 40 years ago, people were saying, hey, here are some great options for you. And now, you know, fast forward, we're regretting every moment of having planted any of those in our yard. So mm-hmm. absolutely. Um, my interest in native ground covers, of course, comes from you know, switching out those particular uh, those particular ground cover options to uh, have native plants that can provide ecosystem benefits and provide alternatives to the lawn. Yes, the naughty unenvironmental lawn that doesn't do much for wildlife and we mow, mow, mow and use all kinds of um, non-sustainable things in the process of doing so and feeding it and whatever. So, yeah. Yeah. The the Um, carbon footprint is amazing. So (laughs) avoid it at all costs. (laughs) <laughs> so you've been thinking about ground covers for a long time, as I recall. I think you even did maybe part of your doctoral work or some graduate work at Cornell years ago on ground covers, didn't you? I mean, this has been a long interest. Yeah, it has. Um, I was in the Urban Horticulture Institute at Cornell, and we were looking for ground covers that would survive urban conditions. And the premise of the research was to use woody plants instead of herbaceous plants. And the reason being that woody plants have year-round structure. And if you're in a, in a city like an urban environment, you can appreciate the fact that herbaceous ground covers uh, lose their foliage over winter and uh, people could step on them and compact the soil. So we were looking for uh, shrubs, in point of fact, uh, that would be up to three feet in height and uh, have some opportunity to spread and cover the ground fairly quickly. So, uh, yeah, it was uh, an interest of mine at that time. And, you know, in terms of recommending shrubs as ground covers, people have kind of shied away from that because they think of the ground cover as traditionally being something that's low to the ground, six or so inches, and spreads. But uh, there are a number of shrubs that can uh, fill that role. Yes, and um, in some spots especially, you want that extra dimension. I mean, plus, it really, um, like I have a hillside just out, uh, I have kind of a, I'm on a very steep site, and just there's a small sort of flat backyard area, and then, and a water garden, and then there's a steep incline again, you know, where the property rises again. And Mm -hmm. I have a lot of woody ground covers on Mm -hmm. that area, 
it's a it's a it's a tough spot to get in there and work in all the time. You know, it's it's precarious. So it's great to have things that are kind of permanent and solid and been there a very long time. And I don't have to get in there all the time and, you know, deadhead or tweak things. Do, do you know what I mean? <laughs> oh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of maintenance that goes in to uh, herbaceous ground covers. And one of the uh, one of the primary shrubby plants that I like to recommend for that exact situation, a hillside that's full sun facing, uh, well drained, is grow low fragrant sumac. It's it's the best choice for so many so many situations because it roots in quite easily. It spreads slowly but um, you know steadily, and it has uh, a lot of uh, beautiful features such as the green foliage during the spring and summer, and they turn beautiful beautiful crimson and uh, wine reds in the fall. So uh, it's a plant that we were recommending, of course, in our uh, graduate research at Cornell, and I see it more and more being used out in the landscape, whether it's urban, commercial, or even residential. So great choice for that, that kind of situation. They love full sun, well-drained soils, and they'll knit your hillside together. Um, it's funny you mentioned that right off the bat because a friend of mine, we were she's been calling me. She used to uh, run... Uh, be the vice president of horticulture at the New York Botanical Garden, and she's since changed mm-hmm. her life and become a a, a physician. <laughs> Midlife oh. change of yeah, <laughs> and mm, she okay. lives near me in this rural area. And now with p- pandemic and everything, she, we talk on the phone once a week. And on Sunday, she said in the weekly call, she said, um, "Oh, I'm just loving what's going on with my Grolo sumac, my new planting." <laughs> so very good. So there you go. Right. Yeah. Well, that's good to hear. <laughs> I guess it had good, co- you know, a lot of, like you said, different colors. It had some good color, and um, yeah, so yeah. she's been pleased with it. All color. Uh, and the fruit of it, uh, the red fuzzy fruit that it produces late in the season is, again, food for uh, robins, goldfinches, chickadees, so that late fall, early winter um, time of year when birds are looking for something nutritious. So, yeah, I think it's a, it's a great plant. I really do. Yeah. I, I love it. Um, so, as we've just inadvertently said, uh, ground cover can be many things of different statures, and um, so it's not just flat to the ground, herbaceous. Um, but I do find that a lot of us with gardens, especially mine is an older garden, I have a lot of groups of shrubs and so forth, um, a lot of area that I used to mow and I want to stop mowing maybe. Sometimes the herbaceous st- stuff is good, especially under groups of shrubs. Um, so mm-hmm. I, I feel like we all have spaces where we could use that rather than, dare I say, the heinous um, bagged um, wood chip bark mulch. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Are we going to talk about mulch today, Mark? No, we're just going to say <laughs> ick. And, and, and yeah, I'm a lover right. of mulch, don't get me wrong, I, I, because I believe mm-hmm. in using a good quality mulch as passive soil amendment and improvement, you know. Right. A right, material that right. breaks down. Um, right, right, yeah. right. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, there are certainly, um, I agree with you, there's a lot of different um, opportunities to use ground covers on any kind of scale. And that was one of the uh, realizations I came to recently when I was teaching the class. And a woman from New Jersey said that she had combined three or four ground covers uh, at the uh, entrance of her house in an area that was formerly just devoted to mulch, as you just said. And she basically uh, combined, I think it was Tiarella and some um, um, oh, Heuchera and um, a, third, a third ground cover. It was just there at the beginning, at the entrance to her house. Um, and it wasn't an extensive area. I think another thing that people think about with ground cover is that it has to cover acres. And when I think of the ground covers that we're suggesting, the native plants um, here at Mount Cuba Center, um, the amount of ground that they're covering can be relatively small. As you said, you know, beneath um, your shrub bed, for example, that may only be 10 feet by six feet. So you can put a ground cover under there, like some of the tiarellas um, or even some of the sedges, and, you know, it's, it's covering the ground. So it really is kind of fulfilling a role, even though it's not what people may think of in terms of a vast expanse of something. Which really comes from our um, connection and association with lawn as yeah. ground cover, right? You, right. you know, I mean, that I think yeah. it's like, because that's big. Um, exactly. It, the uh, garden designer I admire a lot called Claudia West of Phyto Design, mm. um, she mm-hmm. famously has said that plants are the mulch. So in a sort of another anti, 
bagged mulch <laughs> statement. Plants are the mulch, and I think that's true. I kind of call what you were just talking about that, that your student from New Jersey did, um, where you you don't have to make one mass of a monochrome of one plant the way that the ubiquitous Pachysandra, Vinca, um, uh, Heterohelix, what do you say, English ivy. Um, right. Is that right? English ivy? Is that what I mean? Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, you don't have to do that kind of giant stretch of it. I think of it as like when you combine a few in a small or a large area, I think of it as making mosaics. Do you, mm-hmm. do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. It's like living yeah. mosaics. of mo- Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I love that. Um, when, I was, when, I was ta- when I was talking about it in my brown carpus class, I used the term like a tapestry of, exactly. living, of living plants. And living mulch is exactly what... Um, we should think of ground covers as, you know, taking the place of, of the, um, the mulch that people traditionally see in a garden. So, and when you mentioned, you know, the idea of combining a couple of different plants, um, today as I came into work, there's plantain leaf sedge out here in, in the garden, and um, it's also called seersucker sedge because it has a great puckered leaf surface, really neat. Um, and there are many, many sedges out there that can be used for uh, ground covers or other ornamental uses. And plantain leaf sedge out in the garden is, um, is green today. You know, it's not looking like mm. super, you know, June green, but it's still green and providing um, some visual interest out there uh, in the way that we've used it. So it's one of the uh, ground covers that I, I recommend people use because it can take dry to moist soils and part sun to shade. I'm sure, Mark, you have people emailing you constantly, what can I grow in the shade? So, <laughs> right? Have you been I mean, reading my mailbox again, Duncan? <laughs> really? You. You're a hacker, you know, it, huh? <laughs> yeah, really. People say, what can I grow in the shade? What can I grow in the shade? And um, there are a number of sedges. The plantain leaf one I like because of its uh, texture. And mm. I was recently looking over some of the photos that we have here at Mount Cuba, and there's one in which we have plantain leaf sedge coupled with Tiarella, another spring ground cover, uh, pretty little dainty flowers early on in the, in the season. And the combination of the two textures is quite nice. The linear texture of plantain leaf sedge and the more uh, heart-shaped or uh, you know, three, three-lobed shape of the uh, Tiarella, the foam flower, beneath that. And so a great example of saying, okay, rather than, as you said earlier, having a vast expanse of plant X, why not put two or three together uh, that suit the same kind of conditions? Shade, Tiarella, shade, sedge. Right. Um, the, sage, the sedges, the carexes, I uh, have been noticing in areas of my property where I've stopped mowing out to the perimeter, out to the fence line, and I've sort of let them go a little wilder gradually. I'm sort of doing these multi-year experiments to see kind of what comes up and mm-hmm. how that could be managed instead for more diversity and so forth. Um, I've noticed that uh, some carexes, some sedges, have appeared, and I think the one that's appeared the most is finer textured than the uh, the one you just mentioned, the Plantagenea. Is that right, Carex Plantagenea? Yeah. Is that what you were just talking about? Um, yeah, Carex Plantagenea. Yeah. yeah. And, the, and then the, I think the Pennsylvania, maybe the Pennsylvania mm-hmm. sedge. I think that may be what I'm seeing a lot of. It's finer textured. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It is, and you know, when we're talking about lawns, people think of that very fine, narrow-leafed grass that's out there being mowed. And Carex pensylvanica has that same kind of thin, narrow foliage that comes up from a central uh, crown, if you wish, a central, um, uh, I guess crown is the only word I can use. Um, yeah. And it grows up, and then the, uh, the tall, thin foliage cascades over on itself. It gets about a foot tall. And when you plant them as a series of plants together, uh, that gives you a very fine textured and sweet look in the landscape, very relaxed and, uh, and informal look. Um, it looks like grass, but people shouldn't be mowing it. I think that the beauty of the plant is in the fact that its structure is so, is so visually attractive. Um, people have planted it very closely together, to give the impression of lawn, if you wish, uh, and it will do that. It will grow as a uniform mass, but people then have to remember to leave it looking as it does in this sort of lax form until yes. late winter when they can mow it back, mow it down, and then it comes back and um, looks great. It's a, mm. like, it's a beautiful plant, so maybe that's what you have coming in. I'm, but I'm it does sure give the impression of is, yeah. grass, if you wish. 
Yes, it, but it's very beautiful. It's uh, a little more, you know, because you said it's like a little arching and a little, um, you know, it's not as stiff as grass. It's a, no. it's it, well as mown grass. Um, so right. very beautiful. So we should say when we were talking, I forgot to sort of disclaim this, but obviously you're in Delaware. I'm in New York State. Um, the cast of characters, though in mm -hmm. our case some do overlap, and there are some native plants that are that would be good ground covers that are even wider spread across around the country. But you know, each person in each area who's listening, we're talking inspiration here. Um, but we can't tell you the plants for every place of everyone listening. No, <laughs> at the same no, time. no, no. So, so people have to go to a place like the website of or educational um, courses at somewhere like Mount Cuba or uh, their local wildflower center or native plant society or regional native plant society. Um, you know, there may even be an Audubon center or something like that mm -hmm. in their area. Or uh, one thing I've been doing is um, some t the flora, F-L-O-R-A, as in um, um, a survey of all the plants in an area like if you put into Google search the flora of and you say, you know, eastern Pennsylvania or XYZ County, you may come up with someone, some scientist, some nonprofit, whatever, some academic institution who's actually been studying that. And you may even be able to get nitty gritty down to your local area and get some inspiration. So it's kind of fascinating and it's kind of fun to do this sleuthing to find out what mm. your native ground covers are, you know? I, I love that part, but I guess I'm a mm. geek. <laughs> yeah, no, no, well, and you're right, you know, people are listening in from, you know, God knows where here, and, you know, that is one of the primary ways that they can find out about what it is in their specific region that is going to satisfy their ground cover needs. So I, I, I echo your sentiments, you know, get out there on the, on the Internet and find, um, find the flora of your region and... Uh, you know, see what there is available. The yeah. plants that I generally talk about here at Mount Cuba range from zones four-ish down to zone eight-ish. Um, so mm -hmm. zones four to eight in general, sometimes nine, um, a little south of us here into the Carolinas or uh, Virginia. Um, so, so yeah, so the plants that I generally talk about in my class are, are within that kind of a spectrum of hardiness. So, mm -hmm. so um I, I want to just zoom through some more plants. I, I, for mm -hmm. my, where I'm taking out Lamiastrum, horrible plant. Oh. I, hate that I ever planted it. Oh, my goodness. Um, Good luck. I'm taking out miles of it. I'm usually mm -hmm. repeating three digs or three <laughs> uprootings in each area to clear it, you know, and, and even then I get more re sprouts. So it's taking me a oh, year yeah. or something to prep, and then I'm starting to add some little baby plants, which I asked my nursery to, they buy them in normally and pot them up and sell big plants. But I said, look, charge me whatever you want, but I don't need them potted up. I need trays of the little plants and they marked them right. up and sold them to me. You know, they bought them wholesale and, and I got like Christmas fern and mm -hmm. a couple of dryopteris whose name I forget. And, um, anyway, I, I looked up some ferns that were around my area and I've been plugging those in gradually to replace the lamiastrum. Um, so ferns are a whole separate topic. Maybe instead I'd love to ask you about heuchera as you mentioned them before briefly. I, even though mm -hmm. the ones that do the best for the ones that do the best for me as ground covers aren't native to here at all, it's the Heuchera velosa types. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Can you explain to me a little bit about which Heucheras make a good ground cover? Well, Heuchera velosa is actually one of the ones that we recommend down here um, right. at Mount Cuba Center because it does provide that uh, it covers a large space of ground. It will spread to about one and a half, even two feet. Um, and in foliage, it'll get up to about a foot. And then in flower, it'll get up to two feet. So um, the cultivar Autumn Bride, uh, Harry um, alum root is one that we use here on, on site. And it really is a, for us, a relatively no-fail heuchera. Uh, it's hardy from zones four-ish to eight, and it is a part sun to part shade plant. And I've noticed it here where it's in a sunnier location. The heucheras in general in full sun locations aren't at their best. You know, I think that they're really yes. the kind of plant that does far better in a partial shade environment where the soil can remain a little bit more moist. I think heuchera in general uh, is a woodland plant, and it grows sort of in organic -y woodland soils with sort of ample moisture around the roots. So um, 
Autumn Bride is one that we use because it blooms late in the season. Think, people think of heuchera as blooming early in the season. Many of them do. Uh, but this is one that you know, will, will come on in flower, as I said, up to two feet, white flowers, um, late in the season. So you know, that's when we are using the other um, heucheras that are available to people. And there's a whole host of them, ranging in color from green to silver to purple, et cetera. Um, when people plant them as ground covers, I think they have to realize that they don't spread in the sense right. of being rhizomatous. They basically remain uh, in a clump that gets bigger and bigger every year. So um, if I was to use a variety of heuchera, I think that I would use them in um, a smaller uh, smaller application, uh, not, not a huge swath of them necessarily, although Autumn Bride is taking up like a 15 by 6 foot area in one of our gardens. Yes. Um, and just be, be careful to make sure that you're paying attention to the moisture level in the soil. Uh, okay. But there are lots of options there for okay. people to choose from. Another thing um, I wanted to, in the, ne- in the last few minutes, I wanted to ask you about pa- native Pachysandra. Very mm-hmm. different from the Japanese Pachysandra. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. It's not native where I garden, but I've had it for many years in my garden. It's kind of variegated leaf. and. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, it doesn't look at all like the Japanese Pachysandra. You're quite right. It doesn't have that glossy dark green foliage. It has more of a gray, uh, silvery gray to muted um, foliage. Uh, and it's very short to the ground, like its, its Asian counterpart, six to eight inches in height. And it blooms early, early in the spring with very short little cylindrical flower stalks uh, that are, if you're way down there, you can get your nose in, you can smell them, they're fragrant. But the thing about um, Allegheny Pachysandra, the Pachysandra procumbens, is that it is very, very slow to spread. So if you are getting it, you have to be patient with it because you're going to spend a fair amount of money on a plant. And if you get three or four of them to put in an area where they will thrive, which is, again, part shade with a degree of moisture, um, they will spread over time. And, again, it will be relatively slow. So uh, very beautiful plants um, and very... uh, it's just a, a really a softer look than the uh, Japanese Pachysandra. And we've planted it here in combination with uh, a, one of our Christmas ferns. So we have Christmas fern kind of dotted in amongst it. And in one part of the, uh, of the garden, we've also put in some of the variegated um, green and silver-leafed um, heuchera. So they all require the same kinds of conditions, uh, cool, moist, semi-shade, and they make a nice um, textural kind of composition. Mm. Um, in the last minute or two, I want maybe one more shrub that you want to say that you've successfully used. You shared one for the my back hillside <laughs> when I need mm-hmm. to replace what's there. Um, any other shrubs that you're excited about or that you guys use as ground cover at Mount Cuba? Yeah, we use... Um Drooping Leucosoe, Leucosoe fontanesiana, and it's a great plant for uh, the shade, cool shade. It's sort of native to regions uh, where it is on hillsides and banks and associated with uh, waterways um, just south of us here. It's, it's hardy from zones 5 to 9, but I, I saw a huge patch of it at Wellesley College uh, years ago on a hillside, again, a hillside in shade, and once it's established, it'll, it'll really do quite well in that kind of environment. It's ever green. It's uh, related to um, blueberries. It's ericaceous, and so the white flowers in the spring are very, very attractive. Um, and yeah, so evergreen, um, large shrub, uh, three to four feet high by three to four feet spread, again, um, in those cool, shady environments, kind of the opposite of the uh, grow low sumac, hot sun for sumac and right. cool shade for drooping leucosoe. Do okay. not plant drooping leucosoe in the sun, please. Do not. <laughs> do Don't not. do that. Don't torture right. it. Um, right. So, so just in closing, I want to say there are what about six classes now among the offerings? Mm-hmm. Is it, are there mm-hmm. about six? There's weeds. There's ground covers. Mm-hmm. The uh, container class, gardening, um, plants for container gardening, um, instant mm-hmm. butterfly garden. There's one on um, the uh, monarch, um, the milkweeds from monarchs. Yes. And we're going to be changing some of them out in February, March. So we'll have a, a few new ones coming mm-hmm. on board in Feb, March. Um, one of which will be um, native evergreens, so um, people can get sort of wind of what's out there in terms of evergreens for their property, from short little ground cover evergreens all the way up to tall pine trees. Oh, oh, interesting. I was going to ask you about, um, and we don't even have time, but I was going to ask you about the eastern red cedar, your uh, Juniperus virginiana. There's these sort of gray-leaved cultivars. Right. Like, 
gray right. owl, I think, and they're mm-hmm. not too gray short. Owl. They're maybe knee high or so. And those are looking very interesting to me for larger expanses. So, so many yeah. ideas to talk about. <laughs> right. It, it, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. The gray owl will do really well in sunny locations. So yeah, yeah that's one for uh, another conversation. So, okay. Yeah. Well, good. Well, um, Duncan, we're going to have a giveaway. As I said, I'm so glad to speak to you again. And um, mm-hmm. yeah, let's keep in touch because I always learn so much when I talk to people from Mount Cuba. So thank you. Right. Okay, you're quite welcome. Nice talking Uh with you. Programming and underwriting support from Garden Tool Company. Garden Tool Company's wide selection of heirloom quality, quality tools for your gardening passion is backed by outstanding customer service, fast shipping, and ongoing support. GardenToolCompany.com. Programming and underwriting support from Brushwood Nursery. For more than 20 years, Brushwood Nursery has shipped the finest selection of clematis and other vines all over the United States with full gallon-sized plant and free shipping. Their website is full of beautiful pictures and information on growing clematis. BrushwoodNursery.com. Now, don't miss an episode. You can subscribe free to the podcast version of the show on Stitcher or iTunes or Spotify. And you can find me anytime at AwayToGarden.com or on Facebook and on Instagram as at Away to Garden. And happy gardening meantime. Away to Garden with Margaret Roach is a joint production of AwayToGarden.com and the smallest NPR station in the nation, Robin Hood Radio. Mm-hmm.